Hello and welcome to this evening's online London lecture. My name is Mark Searcy and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Science at the University of East Anglia. Our speaker tonight is Professor Corinne Lecaire, a valued member of our School of Environmental Sciences. I'm delighted to be able to introduce her to you today. But first, I'd like to tell you a little about the university's work on climate change research. UEA is well known for its outstanding research in this field. Its contribution has been and continues to be highly significant. We're now in the run up to the UN Climate Conference COP26 in 2021, a summit that will mark five years since the Paris Agreement and aims to coordinate global action on the climate emergency between heads of state, climate experts, business leaders and campaigners. Researchers at UEA will contribute to this conversation with both policymakers and the public, as well as working on world leading research on climate change and its impacts from carbon reduction and new technologies to the effects on biodiversity and the societal changes needed to reach net zero targets. Among these researchers is tonight's speaker, Professor Le Carey. Corinne is originally from Canada and began her studies at the University of Montreal with a one year degree in anthropology in 1987. In 1990, she graduated from the same institution with a BSc in physics. This was shortly followed by an MSc in atmospheric and oceanic sciences from Canada's McGill University, and in 1999, a PhD in oceanography from the Unité Pierre et Marie Curie in Paris. Corinne then went on to conduct research at Princeton University in the US and at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Germany. It was in 2005 that we welcomed her to UEA and she spent the subsequent years both working with us and the British Antarctic Survey. In 2011, Corinne was appointed the director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research and stayed in this role until 2018. So that's just a glimpse of Corinne's impressive background. What is she working on now? Well, as the subject of this lecture would suggest, she's currently conducting research on the interactions between climate change and the carbon cycle. Her research has contributed to an understanding of how climate change and variability affects land and ocean carbon sinks and what drives CO2 emissions. She's also a member of the Royal Society, Chair of France's Holt Conseil pour le Climat, and sits on the UK Committee on Climate Change. As if that wasn't enough, last week we heard the announcement that Corinne had been awarded the Dr. A. H. Heineken Prize for Environmental Sciences 2020. Now considered to be the Netherlands' most prestigious award for arts and sciences, it seeks to honour just five renowned global researchers biannually. Well done, Corinne. We're really incredibly proud of you. Let us give a warm virtual welcome to Professor Le Carey as she begins her talk on COVID-19, carbon emissions and climate change. Thank you uh, for the kind uh, <clears throat> introduction and for the opportunity to speak today and uh, particularly uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, actually come to work. I, I never thought that I would be so thrilled to be at work physically. I'm pleased to be here. Um, it was Seth Borenstein of Associated Press who asked me the first question and that was the 27th of February this year what is the coronavirus going to do to greenhouse gas emissions? Has anyone looked at this? Uh, at that point, uh, China had uh, gone in and out of the lo lockdown. Italy was closed, the US was starting to shut down, and there were low confinement measures around the world. I kind of uh, ducked the question, thinking this will blow over. How big can it be? And then the bombardment started, question after question. Every day, journalists came to me wanting to know more about the one positive impact of the new coronavirus, its effect on the environment. For a few days, I did manage to deviate the questions. I answered generalities. I sent journalists to my colleagues. I said I was too busy until finally, I had to face the reality. I am an expert on the carbon cycle. I published more than 100 papers on carbon emissions and carbon sinks. And to be perfectly honest, I had no idea. 
incredibly embarrassing. So I called my friends at the Global Common Project for an urgent video call. Let's compare notes, exchange ideas. And this is where the COVID journey started for us all. The truth is, things were going OK for climate change before the coronavirus hit. We had one degree Celsius warming, and that part was terrible. This is a lot of warming. If you have had a fever of one degree yourself, you know how it feels. This is how uncomfortable it is for the planet, this one degree warming. But apart from that, actions were beginning to pick up. The Paris Agreement was in place, a masterpiece of diplomacy that brings all countries together, almost. Growing support from public, uh, for public ash actions was uh, growing. Uh, with the Fridays for Future school strikes, uh, Greta Thunberg, Extension Rebellion at one extreme, and famous people, as you see on the slide, keen to shake hands with climate scientists. A real handshake. We will date pictures later uh, from uh, the handshake uh, movement that is now forbidden. The UK and France and Sweden and New Zealand and California and New York State have in law objectives for reducing emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to net zero by 2050. And there was an event coming up, as Mark said, the COP26, where commitments were to be raised. This is now postponed to next year. If I put my really optimistic hat which I need to do sometimes, I would say that even global emissions were starting to cooperate. Here they are. Uh, emissions were still on the rise, about 1%, just under 1% per year in the past decade, but that was slower than the decade of the 2000s. And the last year, 2019, there was no rise in emissions, thanks to a massive decrease in coal use in the US and Europe, and to deployment of renewable energy in many parts of the world, including India. This was certainly nothing to celebrate. Uh, emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases need to go to net zero to tackle climate change. And as long as there are emissions at all, uh, the climate will continue to warm. We are a long way from zero emissions, yet uh, we would like to get there in 30 years. Uh, I should be alive in 30 years, coronavirus permitting, and so this is how fast it needs to be. Uh, at that point, uh, we were comfortably reporting emissions every year, so that is in February, when this rupture took place between the 27th of February and the 7th of April this year, and most of the world went into lockdown. Before I say what happened during the lockdown, I want to say where uh, our CO2 emissions are coming from. Uh, globally, uh, power stations account for the monster share of our emissions. Uh, it, uh, power stations provide electricity for essentially everything we do. Uh, then industry, uh, that's iron, steel, cement, plastics, also textiles, mining. Uh, then surface transport, the third biggest emitter worldwide, uh, cars in particular, trucks and vans as well. Then there's residential, this is home heating, uh, public buildings and commerce, uh, that's shops and hairdressers, very important, critical even. And aviation at the end, which is under 3% of our uh, emissions. The big question was then, which of these sector would be paralyzed by the confinement measures during the pandemic? Would it be all of them? Would they all shut down? Uh, how do they work? Do they need women power? Uh, what happens when people can't go to work? And as it turns out, electricity is the only data stream that is available daily. The rest is not. We are in the dark. So we scratched our heads hard. How could we get to change in sectors emissions essentially live? If you recall people, this is only three months ago, the internet was exploding with circumstantial evidence of shutdown. So we dug and dug and find, found 
577 time series of data. So that's data every day for uh, the same information of all kinds that provided indicators of change in each of those sectors of the economy. Power, incredibly enough, changed very little. Even during lockdown, we keep using a lot of electricity. Industry decreased by about one third, although data there was really hard to get. Road transport, was that was the most fun. Lots of data on traffic, on congestion, on mobility trends. At each point here on the figure, that's a time series, maybe for a city or for a country, we had a point for the UK, very nice data. Some spread in the data, but overall, uh, traffic uh, was cut in half on average in countries that were under lockdown. As for our homes, uh, yes, there are more people at home now, uh, but many did not join empty houses, actually. So increases in emissions there was rather small. And we had no data on public sector, so we made some assumption. And the last point there is aviation. Uh, the sector, sector, aviation sector, literally collapsed during the lockdown, operating at about 25% of uh, its capacity. So that is for the data during lockdown. For each of these 577 time series, we looked at how the information changed when the confinement was light. Typically, don't meet groups of 5,000 people, a dream today. If the confinement was strong, uh, don't go to the office if you ca can avoid it. That felt good at first. Or if uh, it was full lockdown, uh, don't go anywhere. Really? Really. Uh, here is the data for other confinement levels, the targeted confinement, the widespread confinement, uh, where uh, the decreases become stronger and the shelter at home confinement. The last element for our analysis was the confinement level itself. For 67 countries around the world responsible for 90% of the emissions, we looked at how strong confinement measures were uh, every day. Uh, here is how much of the global uh, CO2 emissions were in the region's confinement measures. A quick uh, rise of low-level confinement measures in January. Uh, then China went in full lockdown very quickly in February and very quickly out of it. Then in March, uh, Europe, uh, the US, India, Japan, Russia, all big em emitters all went in full lockdowns at the same time. And already uh, mid-April measures began to ease. At the peak of the lockdown, countries responsible for 89% of the emissions were in some confinement, and today it is at 60%. So we now have three bits of information. How much each country emits in each sector of the economy, uh, how much each sector is affected by lockdown measures, and how strong were lockdown measures for every day for each country that we analyzed. So we combine these three pieces of emission, and you can tell with this how much emissions decrease globally and what sector is responsible for what. First on sectors, we had a few surprise there. Surprise, although surface transport is only the third biggest emitter globally, this is the sector most responsible for the drop in emissions during lockdown. Other surprise, although aviation is the sector that is, was most touched by confinement measures, it only accounts for 10% of the decrease in emissions because it is relatively small to start with. Very polluting, especially long haul, sadly, still small. By the 7th of April this year, emissions had decreased by an astonishing 17%. Here we go. See that blue sky slowly coming up here, here, coming now, and it's gone. Emissions in individual countries decreased more than this, 26% on average, 31% in the UK, but because they didn't decrease 
all at the same time, it lines up to 70%. Let's do it again. Here we go, January, February coming up. The blue sky is coming to your screen with a maximum of now, and it's gone. 17% in daily emissions has never been seen before, as far as we can tell. Yet it takes us back only to year 2006, because emissions have grown so much year on year in the past. Today, uh, these emissions are about 5% below 2019 levels because of remaining confinement measures that are still in place. This drop in emissions, as impressive as it is, will do nothing to slow climate change because although emissions increased, we are still emitting more than 80 million tons of CO2 every single day, even at the peak of the confinement. As long as we continue to emit CO2, the climate will continue to warm with every bit of warming causing more damage and every bit of warming being irreversible. Emissions need to go to zero for the climate to stabilize. I want to delve a little bit here more into uh, that change, uh, that where change was uh, coming uh, from uh, during the lockdown. Uh, first, uh, road transport was particularly important, as I mentioned. As soon as confinement started, emissions from road transport decreased instantly. As soon as the confinement eases, then they come back up again. This is because nothing has changed around us. We still have the same roads, we have the same cars, we still have the same heating systems for the other sectors, the same industries. The changes in emissions during the confinement, they are not structural change. They are forced behavior change, they are painful, they are brutal even. And because of that, it is no surprise that the decrease in emissions won't last. This decrease won't last. These are not desirable changes and they would not take us to zero emissions. Behavior change is badly needed to tackle climate change, but it is something that you accompany. It is something that you accompany by a positive answer, uh, offer. It needs to be attractive. It needs to be good for you. Take transport. There are loads of opportunities to solidify behavior change that could be positive for the individuals and positive for the society. Working from home for those who can and wish could be encouraged, maybe not every day, but regularly. This would reduce emissions, but would also reduce commuting time and pressure on the individuals. Walking and cycling, of course, to work is another one. Again, for those who can, is great for health both because of the exercise and because of the reduction in air pollution for yourself and for others. And for hearing the little birds sing, how great was that? Not happen on their own. They need to be supported, they need to be encouraged. National governments, mayors, employers, organizations need to put in place measures to make it safe and productive for us all to change behavior in the long term in a way that is good and productive for the individuals and reduces the pressure on the environment. This is what we is going to make a change in the emissions in the long term. We need organized structural change to tackle climate change. We have talked about what uh, happened so far. Let's now explore what could happen for the rest of this year. There are many possibilities, but I will focus here on how confinement measures could evolve. First, uh, let's uh, be optimistic and look at what um, would happen if economies recover to their pre-COVID level within six weeks. This is the top red line here. In this case, emissions in 2020 would decrease by around 4% compared to levels last year. At the uh, uh, other extreme, let's assume some confinement measures remain in place uh, painfully, no handshake, until the end of the year. 
This is the bottom red line here. In this case, emissions in 2020 would decrease by around 7% compared to 2019 level. The full range, including uncertainties from the data, is 2 to 12% per year, this year. These scenarios only include the effect of confinement. They don't include deeper effects, uh, such as uh, on the economy or uh, the impact of economic stimulus, positive impact possibly, uh, but they give a good idea of the size of the change we are looking at. Uh, such a big drop in emissions has not been seen since World War II. Although we have, in fact, seen growth in emissions of that size. In fact, right after the last global financial crisis uh, in 2010, uh, the government's economic stimulus led to an astronomical 5% growth in emissions, and ouch for the climate. So the big question, the one that matters hugely for uh, the direction of carbon emissions in the future uh, for, uh, um, is what are world uh, governments going to do this time around? What are we going to do now? Are we going to respond to the current climate crisis in the same way we did in 2009, uh, without a vision, uh, without strategy? Uh, focusing on the here and now only, or are we going to uh, get it uh, this time? The world is a mess. Uh, yes, uh, we did have people in the street requesting climate actions before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but we also had people in the streets who suffered and protested in return. The Gilets Jaunes in the streets of France protested against the fuel tax. Workers in the streets of Ecuador protested against the removal of fossil fuel subsidies. Farmers in the streets of the Netherlands protested against fertilizer control. Commuters in the tube of London had a fight against with a climate activist. The deep, chronic, insidious, persistent, and growing inequalities that plague our societies are coming to bite us in times of crisis. Inequalities mean vulnerable people are impacted more than others again. Inequalities mean measures with good intentions become unacceptable because anything extra is unbearable when your day-to-day -day life is already on the edge. The unbearable pressure we put on the environment and the unacceptable burden of inequality need to be addressed as part of the same path forward that we set as we come out of the current crisis. And are we ready for this? Are we ready to do what it takes to tackle climate change fairly, peacefully? Has the time finally, finally arrived? It is up to us now in the coming weeks. I love this pair of images from two prominent defenders of climate ambitions. It is obvious, isn't it? Put the Green Deal at the heart of the economy, says the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. It's obvious. Time to think the unthinkable, says the president of France, Emmanuel Macron. It's obvious. So hands out, everyone. What do you say? Is it obvious to you? Take climate risks seriously, is what I say. Now is the time to build measures that make us more resilient to future health and climate crisis. And how do we do this? We focus now in this COVID recovery on actions that create jobs and tackle climate change. We invest in green infrastructures. We build cycle paths. We insulate our homes. We install heat pumps, we install renewable power, we electrify 
everything. We train workers to renovate homes, to plant trees, to cook vegetarian meals in canteens and in restaurants. We do not invest in things that lock us into fossil fuels, such as building roads. We do not build new roads. We do not build coal power station if we can avoid it. And we do this as much as we can in a way that is fair and perceived to be fair, that is well justified, but also that is bold. As the time has passed for discrete small actions, and the time has come for clear, open, ambitious actions led by governments that move us entirely to the green economy of tomorrow. Thank you to all those who made the, this work uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you. I will go to my cross now. So we have to socially distance now. So thank you, Corinne. That was an amazingly powerful uh, presentation uh, and lots of food for thought. Um, before we move on to our question and answer session, I'd like to make a small request of you all. We will send an email to everyone who has registered for tonight's event, which will include a short link to a, uh, a which will include a link to a short evaluation survey. We'd be very grateful if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey, which will help us to plan for future events, both online and in person, when we can all meet again in London. OK, so hopefully this will work, but we now have the opportunity for you to ask her in any questions you may have. To ask a question, please click on the purple tab in the bottom right and type your question into the chat. You're the biggest audience we've had so far, which is wonderful, but it does mean that we won't be able to get to every question. And hopefully the questions will come to me uh, on, on my phone. So if any, anybody has any questions, um, please type them in now. Do my glasses? No, I, I can see it. <laughs> Just about. If this is working. So far, we're not getting any questions through. I think it was crystal clear, obviously, or maybe they're not ready for questions. Maybe. Let's That's impossible. Happens. We have got a couple Everybody of questions. I'm going to. I have a question for you. Oh, hang on. I think Mark's got it. Okay. <clears throat> this scared. is Desh Pandey who's asked okay. this question. Uh, with public, with the public being asked to avoid public transport right now, do you think that would build mistrust um, of these green alternatives within society? Uh, it's a big risk. I mean. Of course, uh, with social distancing now, public transport is quite difficult. Uh, I hope this is going to ease. There are measures that governments can put in place and, you know, uh, like uh, wearing masks, like uh, providing hand wash, but, you know, it doesn't stop the fact that a distance around your body makes public transport for the moment uh, very difficult. There is a big risk that uh, people then move to the individual car. And this is why I stressed so much uh, the two other alternatives that they are for some people, which one is work at home or continue as much as you can, and the other one is to cycle and walk and cycling. There's now e-bikes that make it accessible in parts to suburb, but of course not everybody will be able to do that. So there is also a very um, urgent need for government to think and, and deploy a strategy on transport that is much broader than this. And the strategy would be to deploy electric uh, and low carbon uh, cars as quickly as possible. So the electric car is ready now. Uh, it's a bit expensive and it could really use a big boost. And so governments can think about the ambitious strategy. And But those strategies, they need to sort of be said out loud. They need to include uh, installing charging points. They need to include farming people. They need to include organize the supply chain for battery, for battery recycling. They need to include a lot of things, including financial packages for that. They'll take a little longer. So it's not going to be maybe the next weeks and possibly not the next months, but it could be very, very quick. 
And let me just say, because we had this such fantastic question, one thing that happened at the last, at the end of the last global financial crisis that was really good, which is that some governments, mostly Germany, uh, China, and the US, invested massively in renewable technology, solar and wind power, with the result that these technologies, the price plummeted, and they're now very accessible uh, worldwide. And my feeling is that the electric uh, mobility, electric car, is at that moment now where you just invest a lot in it and it could make a very rapid deployment throughout society. Um, okay, uh, second question is um, an interesting one. What's the impact of building more roads? So the thing is, if you build more roads, you encourage more cars. And in a, in a society where you want to go low carbon, mobility is really extremely important, but you have to think about mobility in a way that is lighter. The evidence of the past is the more road we have built, the more they have been, the, 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 the traffic is not limited by, um, it, it is, is essentially occupies all the space. This is what I mean to say. The more road you have, the more you occupy the space with your vehicles, and the more you encourage uh, higher mobility, which now at the moment is with fossil and diesel car. So instead of investing in roads now, now is the moment to invest in electric mobility, and perhaps later there will be a need for looking for things in a different way. Okay. This is more of a political one. Uh, which is if Trump is still in power next year, does COP26 stand a chance? This is, an, this is an interesting one. I have made quite an observation during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which is who is actually in power of action in the United States? Uh, uh, of course, uh, Trump is uh, the, uh, the president of the US, uh, but um, who has decided for the various states and various cities, who has put the measures in place and taking the action is the heads of states and it's the mayors of the cities. So if they have done it for the COVID-19 lockdown, surely they can also do it for carbon emissions. So there's not just the central power, but there are a lot of other people in powerful positions who can make a difference. Yeah, this is an interesting question from um, from Shannon. Um, do you have any specific advice at a more local level? Do you have any specific advice for local authorities and the roles that they can play? Yeah, absolutely. So local authorities, I think it's underestimated the positive role that local authorities can play. I mean, everybody has a role to play and local authorities could accompany the people much more in their uh, actions to do the, um, the actions that matter. So think about home renovations in particular. So uh, local authorities can organize for companies to uh, source uh, renewable solar panels, can organize for companies to source uh, heat pumps and make it possible and easier for people to find ways to uh, have cheaper options, possibly uh, know who to call and, and sort of create a community of actions around, around uh, the low carbon economy. I think there are, I think this power uh, for action is really underused and underestimated and there will be big things that could be done uh, locally for houses, for uh, green spaces and for uh, mobility obviously as well. So you talked a little bit about the um, uh, electric cars but Nicholas has asked um, maybe a, a bit more than that, what, what kind of green infrastructure do you think is the most crucial to build? So um, the green infrastructure, when I talk about infrastructure, I talk about, you know, all, uh, not just big stuff like power plant, but small stuff like a heat pump, an electric heat pump for your house that replaces a gas boiler. This is a green infrastructure. So an electric car is a green infrastructure, even a, even a, like a, like a, like an oven, like a, uh, not a gas oven, That's the other right. induction, thank you, induction oven. This is also a green infrastructure. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about um, on a slightly bigger scale. Uh, so uh, um, uh, a cycle path is a, is a green infrastructure. Uh, a, a wood is a kind of a green infrastructure. Um, 
uh, elevating um, the natural environment to protect against uh, climate impacts um, uh, is, is in, a, in a sense, a green infrastructure. So green infrastructure is not just like solid metal stuff, but it's things that you can use instead of, uh, say, iron and steel, for example, have houses built in wood would be a green infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Um, question here from Chantal Galvin. Um, how, how badly do you think the economic crisis coming out of COVID um, will impact the world's ability to invest in green industry? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a double-edged sword in a way. I mean, clearly um, there are difficulties even now. We see there are lots of projects on renewable energy have had to be stopped uh, because of the difficulty to invest. But this is a moment, I mean, we've heard about eye-watering sums that governments are going to invest in the economy. And in times of crisis, so during the crisis, like up to now, even now even, of course, you need to focus on jobs and you need to focus on your businesses so that your, your economy stays afloat. But in the next few weeks and all the way to this autumn, the governments more and more are going to invest in bits that are there to reboost the economy in the long term. And it's these packages that would make that will make a big difference if those packages can at the same time support the economy, create jobs, but be invested in the right places that sort of takes your economy out of fossil fuel and into green energy. So you see a big role for business within climate change? Absolutely, there's a big role. I mean, business is the provider. Business need to make an offer that is a green offer. They're there to accompany the people and make this offer uh, so that, uh, so that uh, the people can actually make choices that are aligned uh, with uh, the environment. So, is it realistic that the changes that you've um, suggested are possible under a kind of a, a society that's based on capitalism? Um, this is a too big a question for me, <laughs> uh, but I guess like if I cut it down a little bit, a simpler question that I get asked a lot is, uh, do we need the degrowth of the economy? So is a growth, endless economic growth, um, coherent and consistent with tackling climate change. Well, if the focus is only on endless economic growth, then absolutely not. I mean, any growth that we uh, factor into society has to be coherent with respecting the limits of the environment. Maybe the economy is unlimited, but the environment certainly has very clear, rigid limits and decisions, they have to be aligned with this. It's interesting that most of the questions that are coming in are, are based around the idea of the relationship between business and capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, business and, and climate change and, and yeah. capitalism and climate yeah. change and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I think I'm at the end of what's coming in. Okay. Um, so I think at that point, it yeah. would be good to uh, to thank you once again for a, for a, a fabulous uh, talk and, and a huge amount of food for thought uh, for anybody who's uh, who's who's watching, and uh, and and thank you very much for the uh, giving the UEA London lecture. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to you.